Hello everyone and welcome to the first episode of the Ignites Knowledge series entitled What Is? My name is Neil and together with Ilva, Gustavo and Xuan Ming, my co-founders of Ignites, we hope that everyone who is tuning in today is ready to enrich their brain and learn a little bit more about sports scheduling. Before we go on to our main topic of today, allow me to give you a brief introduction about Ignites and why we have launched this online series. Ignites is an international network of event professionals who wants to make a difference in the events world. We provide specialized consultancy services in combination with active and integrated support of project delivery. We are also strong advocates of education, and it is one of Ignite's main pillars. Within the scope of education is knowledge sharing, and we believe that knowledge sharing is vital to the continued innovation and improvement of policies and processes in the sports industry, and actually in all other industries for that matter. With that in mind, Ignite's launching this What Is series serves as a cornerstone of what we hope to be a rich source of information for future and established event professionals alike. The founders of Ignite's, who I mentioned before, the four of us, we have been working in the industry for the past decade, and we realize that it is actually not really easy to obtain information and knowledge about the industry, especially in very specific topics around the planning and organization of a sport event without getting practical experience working in an organizing committee or attending a sport management course. So the aim of this series is to provide you some of that specific knowledge and information and at the same time, create a dynamic learning moment where we will dive into the basic who, what, when, how, and why questions around a specific topic like media operation, transportation, hospitality services. Today, we are going to learn about sports scheduling. And hopefully at the end of each episode, you, will, you guys will have this like, aha moment you know so that because you learn something new right so each episode we will feature a specialist directly from our ignites family or within our network of experts who has a passion for and practical experience in each focus area and today we have a very good friend of mine ursula venoso who is tuning in all the way from rio de janeiro and she is an expert in sports scheduling. Her experience in planning and developing sports schedules goes back 13 years, starting from working at the Rio 2007 Pan American Games to the Rio 2016 Olympic and Paralympic Games, and also the Buenos Aires 2018 Youth Olympic Games. She is now doing some sports scheduling freelance work for the Olympic Broadcasting Service for Tokyo 2020. Okay, okay, okay. enough of this introduction. Let's not waste any more time and I'm gonna bring Ursu in. Hi, Ursu. Hello, hello everyone. Hope you all are well. Hello, Neo. Hi, hi, how are you? I'm good. I'm good. It's sunny here in Rio. It's warm, so it's good. How are you? Good, good, good. It's already dark here, so it's already night. <laughs> okay, okay. So we are not going to waste any more time uh, because your fans are waiting and they are waiting and eager to learn. So I'm going to pass the floor to you. So thank you, Neo, and uh, thank you, Ignite, for the opportunity. Um, as Neil presented me, I'm Ursula. I work in Rio 2016 Olympic Games and Paralympic Games with sports scheduling. I work also in Buenos Aires 2018 with sports uh, schedule and uh, sports program. It's a theme that I like very much. I hope you will enjoy it too and you understand a bit more after this session. 
So let's get started. What we get are going to see on the schedule. Just, uh, okay, so now it's working, sorry. So we're going to see the different views of the schedule. We're going to see a timeline and the steps to build up the document. We're going to see the stakeholders and how to liaise with them and how to share information with them. We're going to see the building blocks and also some reflection on the, on the thing. So when you think about competition schedule, what do you think about? It may be that you have a ticket session and you want to go to a venue and you want to know what time to go to your venue. It may be that you have a favorite athlete or favorite team and uh, you want to follow their competition. You want to know when to turn on the TV, when to buy the tickets, how to follow their competition. Maybe that uh, as many of us, you walk in, in our organizing committee and you see a park full of people or a cluster full of people and you think about uh, what ticket session they might have, what are they queuing up for, what's going to be their flow. And maybe they work in a particular venue and you think about your shift, what's going to happen today, what time do I get in, what time do I get out of the shift, what is happening. So all of those are different views of the schedule and depending where you are, what you're interested in the moment, you're going to have different views and you want to have different information from competition schedule. So we're going to understand today that sports scheduling is not just a timetable with all the events and the time for each one of the disciplines, but it's also an operational tool that will help you organize and plan your events if you're an organizer, if you're a stakeholder, or even general public. So when do we start to think about competition schedule in our organizing committee? You know that many cities during the transition, the big book, they include the competition schedule. So that's how early we start to think about this document. And uh, you can see here from Rio, I know it's very hard to see. You just have to imagine that each one of those boxes, the blue boxes, are competition days, and the yellow uh, boxes are just finals. The green one on the top is the opening and closing ceremony. So that's how early we start to think about the competition schedule. And we're going to develop this throughout the planning phase. And uh, we're going to deliver this very close to operational uh, phase, if not in the operational phase. We're going to understand that the uh, competition schedule is a critical document that will impact almost all functional areas within an organizing committee. For sure, the athletes will be impacted. National Olympic Committee, international federations, media sponsors, broadcasters, uh, general public, almost everyone will be impacted. So how do we build up? What are the steps to build up this document? I'm going to present to you the timeline for Summer Olympic. It may be different from sport to sport, but the steps are going to be the same. And it's important to have a timeline when you're going to deliver each one of the information. So after the previous event, after the previous Olympic, for example, we're going to identify the number of days each sport will compete on, if there is any rest day required, if there are, uh, if you need uh, some spare days for, for, for this discipline, if you need a transition time for, for the venue, if you're having two disciplines at the same venue at the same time. And we're gonna deliver this actually six to nine months after the previous games, around four months before the, the uh, events will start. We're gonna also develop this daily schedule with the number of sessions we think each one of the, the disciplines will compete on. So we're gonna have a morning session, an evening session, or a morning, afternoon, and evening session. From that, we start to develop the session schedule. So the session schedule has the time, the start time for each one of the, the sessions, and the end time for each one of the sessions. We know that session, the start time is uh, fixed, it's pretty much fixed, but the end session, the end time of the session is something um, that can change a lot. Because if you think about a competition like tennis, how long is a tennis match? So it's very hard to predict when the session will finish. So you can have an estimated time, but it's not going to be fixed. Uh, the start time will for sure be fixed. For Summer Olympics, we develop this and we deliver this to IOC executive board two and a half years before the game. So let's see some examples. This is Tokyo uh, daily schedule. We know that it's changing a bit because it's changing days, but it's still a good example for daily schedule. So you can see the dots here are the days the competition will happen. If they smack with a medal, it means that we're going to have finals on that day. We can move on to the session schedule. You're going to see that the boxing, for example, on day 9 of August is starting at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And it's finishing around 3, um, 4, 5 to, to 4 o'clock in the afternoon. You can see that the ticket session only has the start time of the session. 
because it's the only thing that we know that it's fake. From this, we start to think what's going to happen in this session. So what events will be in this session? Is it going to be preliminaries for women handball, or is it going to be 100 meters freestyle for men, or individual medley for, for men and women? What's going to happen in that session? We deliver the event schedule, and that's called the event schedule, 33 months before the competition. From this, we start to refine this document, we define this information, and you have the detailed event schedule. So we're going to start to put times for each one of the, the events that we are thinking about, the exact phase, the exact amount of heat, race, bout, whatever we're talking about here. And we deliver this 26 to 20 months before the games. So here's an example from Rio for swimming. You can see that we don't know how many heats there are because we don't have the, the entries for the athletes. So we don't know how many athletes went, will enter, for example, for the individual medley for men. But we have some information, informations from previous game and from uh, the athletes that are qualifying. So we know more or less how long it's going to take. And we uh, include this in our order and we see how it's going to go the session for us. After this, we start to develop the nightmare of everyone in the sport department. No, I'm kidding, but it's a very, it's a, a very thorough document. It's called the Detailed Competition Activity Schedule. It's developed by the sport, uh, by the sport uh, managers of each one of the sports. And it's a minute by minute of what's going to happen in the competition. So let's take football, for example. You know that the match is going to start at 2 o'clock. But before the kickoff of the match, you're going to have the presentation of the athletes. You're going to have the presentation of the judges, the official photos, the anthem. What time does it, is it going to happen? So your presenters will need to know what time is going to happen. Your uh, volunteers will need to know when to bring in the athletes. Your staff will need to know how to do it. So this is the details. It's a minute by minute of what is going to happen in your competition. We also develop the sport, uh, the daily sports activity schedule, which is also a very minute, but it says not just things that will happen with the competition, but uh, when you're going to open the venue, when you're going to open the sauna, for example, when the sports equipment will arrive at this venue, and so on. So I took an example of uh, details uh, for athletics, and athletics is very interesting because there is a lot of things going on at the same time. So you can see here, you can have the track events, you can have the javelin throw, the high jump, the long jump, everything happening almost at the same time. And um, it's, it's, you need to understand what's going on. So we're gonna have, for example, the 800 meters uh, victory ceremony for men at 8.15. And then we started the long jump, we start the javelin throw, and then you know that 8.40, we're gonna have the, 100, the 110 hurdles men semifinal three. So before that, you have to present the athletes, you bring the athletes on, there's all the other events going on. Your volunteers will need to understand and your staff will need to understand how to walk around the venue. You cannot pass through the turf to put on the hurdles if you have a javelin throw. The media that's working on the, the venue will also need to understand what's going on so they are not in, the, in front of the cameras or they can take a better place for whatever they are, they are preparing for. Now we're going to talk about the stakeholders who uh, will will receive the information and will give some feedback on the information. So I said that almost uh, all functionary areas are impacted in the competition schedule. Think about ticketing, for example. They will need the competition schedule to understand when to start the competition, what, how many tickets they will have, how to sell the tickets, and so on. Venue management, for sure, will need that information so they know when to open the, the venue. They know uh, when to, to let the spectators in, uh, how many people will be working. Even, even uh, services will need to understand how the flow will go, when, when it's going to start, when it's going to finish, how to do the crowd, man, uh, crowd management. And transportation, when the athlete should arrive at the venue, when the international federation should arrive at the venue. And even if you think about food and beverage, for example, if you have uh, beach volleyball, as we had in Rio running until one o'clock in the morning, you can understand that the athletes will arrive at the village very, very late, at around half past one, two o'clock, maybe in the morning, and they will want to eat because they just had the competition and they will be hungry. So almost all areas will be impacted by competition schedule. So how do we work with those stakeholders? 
first of all, we do a, a change management uh, group, working group, uh, in the in the very beginning of the organizing committee. We establish some processes and uh, some timelines to develop the, the schedule and to give information, to receive information, to understand the requirements, to understand the challenges that each one of the functional areas might be facing, and uh, to give back also some feedback to them. We know that competition schedule is very interesting and can bring curiosity from, from general public. So we need to work with communication on timeline when to deliver this information to the public. We want to give some taste and some understanding of what's going on in the in the planning of the the, the event. We don't want to give all the information or all the versions that you're preparing. We have a lot of versions of competition schedule, and this can be very uh, confusing for general public. So you want to have a timeline to disclose this to the public. Thinking about the Olympic family and those that work uh, in the organized in, in the Olympic family. So of course the authorities, if it's IOC, if it is for EZU, if it's the Panama authorities, whoever is organizing the event will have some feedback, will have some input to you, and will also want to receive this document from you. International federations, they have the rules, the principles of the, the, the sport, they have the technical requirements, and then they deliver high level competition throughout the years of that sport. They will have a lot of feedbacks and very important feedback. You should liaise with them very closely from, from the beginning. Broadcasters. Broadcasters will give you some important information if they are broadcasting to a worldwide audience or even, even they are broadcast to local audience. So let's think about, for example, diving. You can have one dive after another uh, as far as that competition goes. But if you think about TV, it's good to have a half an hour break between each one of the dives, or maybe one hour break, or one minute, sorry, half a minute break, or maybe one minute break between each one of the dives. So you can have the replay, and it's good to see on TV the replay, and it's good to follow the competition as well. So they will have very important and very interesting information and feedback to give to your suggestion. And you have to liaise with them, the international federations, the event authorities and the organizing committee to put up a schedule that is good for everyone. Thinking outside the Olympic family, we're going to have the government authority. So municipality or government authorities, they will tell you uh, when it's best and how possible it is to close, for example, the, the road in a road cycling event. Maybe that you have, you know, the competition that I spoke about in Rio, that's going to one o'clock in the morning. How will your public your general public and spectators exit in the venue in one o'clock in the morning. Are we going to have subways? Are we going to have extra buses? How are they going to leave and go home from, from the venue? How your staff are going to leave from the venue after one o'clock? Because if your spectators are leaving at one, the staff will leave a bit, a bit uh, later. How they will go home? Maybe you have a very early uh, competition happening. How will they uh, they arrive at the venue at the, for this competition. So now all of those, you have to work very close with the government authorities and municipalities to understand the constraints, the requirements, and also to, to give them some, some feedback on how you're planning to deliver this competition. So let's talk about things that we have to think about when we are we're building a, a competition schedule. So we have the competition rules and technical requirements that we spoke about from the internet. National Federation. Think about rugby. It's a very dynamic, it's a very good sport to watch. Maybe that you want to have more than three days of uh, competition. Uh, Rio was three days for women, three days for men. Maybe they want to have more uh, days of competition or more sessions of competition. But it's a very demanding sport for the, the athletes. So maybe that uh, you're not going to deliver high level, um, high level competition because of the requirements of the sport if you deliver over more than three days. So you need to understand from the International Federation what is the constraint, what is the requirement. Think about weather. Weather can impact your planning and your operational phases. So planning the, the competition schedule, you have to think about things like um, rough sea, if you have an open water swimming um, in the sea, for example. So in Rio, we had a rough sea just last week. If we would have our open water swimming, uh, marathon swimming, at the sea, it would be very difficult to deliver this competition at this time. So we're going to need to spare this to think about contingency and spare this for that competition. Um, 
it may be that it's pouring rain or in winter Olympics, it's, uh, you don't have enough snow or you have a lot of snow. And this will happen, it will impact your operations also for competition. And this day in Rio, for example, it was pouring rain and we had to stop the, the competition for athletics uh, for some, some minutes and then resume after this. Um, venue management and crowd management uh, in the venue. So you can see here is a um, Rio 2016 uh, path, Olympic path. And you can see you have four arenas at the left plus the velodrome. And then you have the Olympic Athletic Stadium right at the back. If you start everything nine o'clock in the morning, for example, you're gonna have a lot of people on the boulevard and maybe that the people that um, in, they're going for the velodrome or the first arenas will stop and it will make it harder to get to the future arena which is the very in the very end of the Olympic Athletic uh, Stadium. So you need to think about staggering your competition, for example, starting with the ones in the, in the back before the ones in the front, so people can have a nice flow. So working together with venue management, event services, crowd management, they will have some information for you how to build up your competition schedule so you can ease the, the challenge they will have in the venue. You will not solve everything, but you're going to have a very good, um, you, can, you can try to help with that. Showcasing your event to uh, broadcast or to media. So if you think uh, in Rio, we had um, finals for badminton in the morning, which is not usual. But we were thinking about the Asia marketing. Uh, so we had the, mo the morning. Uh, the Asia audience in, in, with the badminton. Uh, thinking about Tokyo, they might have the, the finals for swimming in the morning. Thinking about the audience in America and Europe. So we can change a bit the competition schedule, play a bit with it, so we can try to maximize our audience around the world. Um, now let's talk about some, some new things on the on competition schedule. So we know that uh, the Agenda 2020 for, from IOC, we speak about gender equality. And the gender equality, uh, one of the points they are thinking about is to have competition schedule developed, uh, based, making decision based uh, on competition schedule for gender equality. Uh, we started to think about this in Buenos Aires. Of course, it was uh, very, it wasn't, uh, it was too soon to think about it, but uh, we started to think about competition schedule based on gender equality. Back in Buenos Aires in 2018, uh, IOC uh, started to, to have a group, a working group that uh, are thinking and making decisions and are trying to achieve a balanced competition schedule by the Winter Olympic of uh, Beijing 2022 and also the Olympic Games of Paris 2024. So let's summarize what we talked about today. We saw the different stakeholders and uh, we understood that uh, making the change, uh, the competition is schedule changing group and the change management process and the reporting. Uh, as soon as we start the, the organizing committee, it's a good way of uh, dealing with your stakeholders. We saw the timeline and the steps that we took to develop the document. We have to think about the specificities of each, each, each event and where you're doing it and how to, to build up your competition schedule and think about ways of improving your competition schedule. So that was uh, for scheduling. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed it. Even though I've been working in different organizing committees, there's always something new that I learned. I, I didn't know about this uh, gender equality uh, that the IOC is trying to implement in the competition schedule. So would that mean that there would be the same amount of time for men and the same amount of time for women? Well, it can be, or it can be, for example, to have, um, you know, that always, uh, usually they have the men finals after the, uh, the women's and then the men's finals. You can be switching around, you can have exposure time. I'm not sure how they are thinking about, but maybe that's a live broadcasters, uh, live broadcasting for, for each one of them, or it can be uh, having the same amount of competition for men and women in one session. It depends on how they want to develop it. Okay, 
That's cool. All right. So um, to our fellow audience who is uh, listening in, uh, if you have any questions, please do not hesitate to ask also right now. And I'm going to take one from Ilva. And she's asking, how big is normally the team that works on sports scheduling? So in Rio and Buenos Aires, we are, uh, we are two persons, uh, me and someone else who was working with me. I understand that uh, Tokyo we might have more than uh, it's around five people, if I'm not mistaken. But uh, it depends on the organizing committee and how you structure your competition schedule. Okay. So, uh, was there, I mean, is there a big difference between Rio and Tokyo? How did you actually manage to do it with two people and Tokyo is having five people? What, what would be your ideal uh, team size if you would run another, organ, uh, run another Olympic Games? So I'm not too sure how many people is working with us in uh, in Tokyo. I think it's five. It might be less or might be more. Uh, and I'm not sure how they are structured. In, um, in Rio, in Buenos Aires, we we were structured. Uh, we developed based the step by step that I told you about. We worked together with the sports uh, management uh, management team uh, to understand to get the information, and uh, we have good data management system in place. So. So that was how we were in Rio. That's great. I, I think Rio was uh, a very complex project. Uh, was that one of your most complex projects that you worked on? It was and was also one of the projects that was longer. I started in Rio 2016 in 2011. So I got to see all the faces of the organizing committee and understand all the faces and what was happening. So that was a very... Um, there was a project that I could grow a lot, let's say. Okay. So, um, Urso, what would you say um, to be successful in this area of work that you have? Uh, what kind of skills do you need? Uh, I would say that uh, you have to understand how to lay eyes and your, you have to understand how to listen to your stakeholder, how to lay eyes with them. It might be that you're working with a colleague in an organizing committee and then you have to go to a executive meeting in the municipality or something like that. So you have to understand, you have to listen carefully to what they have to say and try to, to, to make the best schedule possible for everyone. And you have also to have good data management skills uh, to understand, to deal with data, have to like data, that's, that's for sure. So I think that's why we are friends, right? Because we love data. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I know you like Excel. I like Excel. We are Excel geeks. That's yeah. right. <laughs> okay, um, Urso, I just also wanted to ask you, because you mentioned about timeline uh, and, and the timeline examples that you had given in the presentation, I guess that is more towards the Olympic Games, right? That's so for for a normal let's say for pan ams that you had worked was it the same timeline that you used or it was different so i worked in the pan, -Am uh, the pan american games so i entered um six months before the game i worked with a training schedule uh, uh, um, but i think it's different because you have a different uh, scenario you have um you, you may not have all the structure that you have in a, in a summer Olympics. Uh, and also it's not so, you may not impact the city as much. So it depends on whoever, whatever structure you're working on. The important thing is to have a timeline agreed with all your stakeholders. So you understand when to deliver information and they understand also when they're going to receive the information. Because there's a lot of, uh, people get very anxious to understand how the competition will go. And sometimes it's not so easy to build up a competition schedule if you don't have all the elements that you need. Right, right. Okay, we have a question from our friend, Luis Armando, who was with us in Buenos Aires. And he's asking, scheduling for major events are planned minute by minute. What happens when something goes wrong? <laughs> <laughs> so there's a lot of time that things will go wrong, Luis. Uh, hello. So there's a lot, uh, there's a many times that things will go wrong. We have uh, contingent plans. If uh, we cannot run a competition for one day or for 
a few days. Uh, we have always have contingency plans for all the competitions for all the days. Um, if something goes wrong, it's just uh, delay the competition. We'll try to, to resume as soon as possible and finish the day as we are planned. If not, then we try to impact the minimum as possible the next sessions, but there will be some impact. Uh, important thing is to think about um, the athlete, the time for the rest and the time for eating and, and the requirements. So uh, International Federation is always on board with us. And we also have, uh, have in, the, in the MOC, in the Main Operation Center, we always have a meeting where we have uh, the the event organizers is the IOC, and then we have the sport department, and we have the people in the venue. So we have the venue management, and we have the the timing scoring team and broadcasters, and we have also broadcast centrally if it's Olympic. And uh, we try to understand how to best resume the competition to impact minimal as possible the the next sessions, but also to have a fair uh, environment for the athletes. So Luciana also says that her question goes along with Luis, uh, which is how to foresee the how to foresee the unforeseen, because uh, as you mentioned also, you always plan for contingencies, right? So and and you always what you mentioned in your presentation was spare days. You always have spare days. So these are part of the contingency plan. Yeah, so for most of the disciplines, we have a spare day. Uh, most of the outdoor disciplines, we have a spare day. So, for example, triathlon, uh, open water swimming, rowing, canoe, we have always have a spare day because, you know, sailing, you know, those, those, those competitions are, they can be impacted by the weather and the, the, there might be some impact in the competition. Uh, we always have contingency plans for all the disciplines. So we may not foresee what is the problem that we're going to have, what is the challenge that we may have, but we just say, well, if the competition uh, cannot run from the, the uh, quarterfinals, how are we going to do it in two days or how are we going to do it in two sessions? So we just try to understand how to continue the competition, whatever is happening. Right, right. So um, we have another question from from Ilva. She's like, Ursula, can you share some examples from events, how different aspects influence scheduling? And then she had a, a follow up here. For example, why in Sochi, some skiing events were happening really late in the evening or in Doha for athletics championships when the marathon was happening almost in midnight? So um, I didn't I didn't work in those those organizing committee. I'm not too sure why they, they chose it, but it can be for example marathon. It's um, if it's too hot, you can have the marathon running at night, or maybe for all days. It depends on, on how you go. So I know that uh, for Tokyo marathons are going to be very early in the morning because of the heat, and um, it can be that you have a weather requirement that you will have competition running late. Uh, it can be, for example, I know that in Rio, badminton was um, the matches were very, very good. That the, they were very, the athletes were uh, were very competitive, and we had matches uh, competition. The, the sessions were running a bit late because the matches were a bit longer than we expected. So these are things that might happen. You have a very good relay, and then you're gonna have a, uh, a session that's running a bit late. But I, I also remember that uh, when in Rio, um, the competitions for badminton, table tennis, they were actually on our prime time here in Malaysia. Yeah, so one thing that we try to think about is how to, how to broadcast and how to, to maximize our audience. So one thing that we thought about in Rio was that uh, we had um, table tennis discussing on week one. We had archery starting on week one, and we wanted to give some favor to, to Asian in the week two. So we tried to move that winter to the second week, so we could maximize our exposure in Asia on the second week. Uh, and for sure, for Rio, it was, it was good, because we still have people going to the, the venue and everything. We just tried to balance the number of uh, finals and the, the, the events that we're going to put in the first week and the second week of the, the game. Okay. 
We also have a question from our Hermana, Romina Gonzalez. How do you deal with IFs and broadcasting? And I think this is something which you had addressed earlier. You said that part of a skill that you need for this work is communication. Yeah, you have to have good communication. You have to understand and to note the requirements. Uh, you have to follow what they are saying. So uh, I have to have the rules and the requirements and they know how to deliver the competition. Uh, broadcasters will have very interesting and um, suggestions and comments on it. So you just have to put them on the same page, just deal uh, with them and, and put them on the same page so you can make the best schedule as possible. And also you have to think about your event. So what is best for your event, for your organizing committee? And uh, you try to balance all those requests and suggestions to, to deal, to, to make a competition schedule. Okay. I think we have time for two more questions and it's going to be my questions. But before we go to my questions, we have a comment from Mariana Pando and she said, super clear, Usu, gracias. <laughs> Thank you, Mari. <laughs> Okay, so uh, my second last question is um, what uh, was it like for you to first work uh, with sport scheduling? Uh, how did you choose this area? So it was something that uh, was almost accidental. Uh, I joined the Rio 2016 organizing committee to work with results within the sports department. And uh, we went to to observe London, and we just decided to change a bit the, the sport department and the, the way we thought about structuring. So competition schedule, there wasn't anyone assigned for it, and I I chose the competition schedule, I was assigned for it, and I very much liked it. So from this moment on, that I understood, and then I understood all the challenges and all the, the how it was, I really like it, and that's something that I like doing. So when when you did it in Rio 2007, and then when you went to in Rio 2007, I worked with a training schedule. I didn't work to, uh, with the competition schedule itself, but all the training schedule for all the, 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 the disciplines. Right. And what was what do you what would you say was the most challenging for you? Um, I think Rio 2016 was the most challenging because it was the first time I was working with a um, with a big uh, organizing committee as that and all the stakeholders and I was learning. So I was learning while I was doing it. Uh, so that was challenge, but it was also a good opportunity to grow and to understand what to do. Yes, I, I always feel that the challenging projects are the ones that teach us the most. <laughs> For sure, for sure. Yeah. Um, the was good as well because it's, it has a different um, different elements. They have the, the education program. They have other programs that uh, you have to balance with the competition schedule, which is good as well. Um, so it was a different uh, level of understanding of, of learning as well. Okay. Uh, we we have one one late question here from our good friend Laura Canals. In your ideal world, how would you structure the team and what would be the positioning in the OCOG, especially for planning? So I understand that, uh, hello Laura, and I understand that you're talking about the team for, for um, competition schedule. Uh, I would I would uh, continue the same, having two to uh, two to three persons working on it. Um, for sure, one of them would uh, would be a local, so they they understand um, so one understand the organizing committee and uh, understand how 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 it's going. But uh, and I would start this as soon as the the previous uh, event finished. So, for example, if you have the Olympics. Uh, 2020 or 2021, I would start soon after that because that's when we start the planning competition schedule. And I would have two to three persons in the team, um, all together, three persons, uh, just to, to have uh, to deal with all the information that you need to deal. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Laura, for that question. I think it's, it's a very good question and very relevant for future organizing committees. 
And I think we also have one question from Luis. Scheduling or experience in scheduling, could it be used in another industry or as a different profession? What do you think? Um, yes, we deal a lot uh, with the logistics. We deal um, so when you think about scheduling, you think about logistics, how you're going to um, schedule, how you're going to include everything that you need at the same day, at the same time. So for sure, you could be using other industries. You could be used for TV, for example. There's programming on TV. But you, are, you can also use this in other, because we deal with requirements with different stakeholders, data management. So you can include this in almost um, every organizing, every organization that might have logistics on it. And it also improves your Excel skills, right? So you can use Excel anywhere. <laughs> for sure, for sure. <laughs> Okay, so my last question before we close this session, it has been very interesting, Musu. So my final question is, what kind of improvement would you like to put in place for sports scheduling if you work in another organizing company? So one thing that I think about is um, having a system from the early beginning of an organizing committee. We do have a competition schedule system, but it arrives very late in the organizing committee. So having a system that will have will help you to have the data management you need. Uh, of course, Excel is, is it does the job, but uh, if you need to transfer this to another um, system, you might need something that will import your data from, from the Excel that you have. So this is something to think about. This is something to improve. OK. So thank you very much, Ursu. Uh, 45 you, minutes have just passed by. That was extremely interesting and extremely insightful. I think if I'm not doing sport entries, I can do uh, sport scheduling because I like data. So you can be my guru. You're going to be fine in that. <laughs> so I hope that uh, those who are listening in and those who will be watching this recording at a later time, I hope that you guys learned a little bit more about sport scheduling. I really did. And maybe you will be able to put this into practice when organizing an event. Or like Ursu said, maybe if you are working in, in broadcasting, you know, you can actually put into practice uh, what Ursu had said. So if you have any further questions, do not hesitate to contact Ursula. You can find her on LinkedIn. And she will be more than happy uh, to help you and give you some of her knowledge. Our next episode will be next Thursday on the 16th of July at 3 p.m. Swiss time. Don't worry, we will post it on Facebook so that all of you can uh, get a reminder. Uh, so if you're interested to learn more about venue media operations, do tune in next, next Thursday and 16th of July. And also do follow Ignites on our social media pages. And I would like to wish everyone the a great rest of the week and I'll see you next week. And once again, thank you very much to Ursula, our sports scheduling guru. Thank you very much, Neil, and thank you, Ignite. And thank you everyone for joining us. Bye. Bye bye. <laughs>